Good morning again. I'll try to convey three things to you today. One, how do you think about the future, particularly the future of urbanism in India? Number two, since a lot of young hopefuls are here, what are the kind of challenges you have in building an infrastructure business, especially in light of my experience in Kochi over the last five years? Kerala being a particularly difficult uh, geography to do infrastructure business in. And thirdly, what is the future of mobility in Indian cities, where all the business opportunities for young people like you will come from? So that's what I plan to do. You know, we don't think about how we think. First thing we need to do when you look at urbanism and mobility is how are you thinking? There are three types of thinking, basically. One is coping thinking, you know, like which uh, bus should I take today? Which car should I take today? What should I do in the evening? Should I go for a movie? How do you cope from day to day? That's instrumental thinking, day to day thinking. And a lot of our time is spent on coping thinking. What do I do? How do I get rid of that fellow who's coming to see me at 11.30? What do I tell him? What's for dinner? All that kind of stuff. What, what do I watch on TV in the evening? That's coping thinking. Then, of course, there's tactical thinking. This is uh, sh short term thinking. It's focusing on outputs and not on outcomes. You know, like, what do I do to get that guy to, you know, uh, come and see my daughter next week? Or, you know, how do I mangle the five days leave from my boss to go, to go on a holiday? Or, you know, uh, sh should I write for the GMAT and try for something next year when do I start preparing? That is tactical thinking. It's basically focused on outputs. Then, of course, the most important thinking which we all neglect to do is what is called directional thinking. Where am I going? What do I, who am I? What do I want to do in life? And this is something which we need to stop in our tracks and think about. And even looking at larger issues as man as a species, the future of India, the future of, of where we are going, we have to do a lot of what is called directional thinking. Where are we going? You know, by the year 2030, 750 million Indians will be living in cities. That is the population, more than the population of Europe today. That's twice the population of the United States of America. If we don't get this urbanism piece right, India can become a dystopia. And if you do it right, India can become a paradise. So this little quote by Louis Carroll, I, I put it on the metro stations also. If you don't know where you're going, any road will take you there. So you basically have to stop in your tracks time to time and uh, think where, which way you're headed. And on this thinking, there's also one thinking at the top of the scale, which I didn't put, that's mindfulness thinking. Let's stop in your tracks and you know, completely efface everything from your mind and do mindfulness thinking. I didn't put because you know, that is not really part of uh, today's agenda. So also, there are various types of thinking. There is self-preservation thinking, you know, when an elephant blocks your path. As I recently was going, trekking in Irivikulam, Went around the corner and found an elephant about to charge at me. That's self-preservation thinking. What do you think? Run back. That is one. Self-aggrandizement thinking. How do I make more money? You know, how do, now the stock market is going really up. What do I do now? Do I short something or the other? Rajesh will know better about. Then of course the gene pool perpetuation thinking. You know, when you fall in love with somebody, that is the gene pool perpetuation thinking. When you teach us, when you send your children for tuitions, that is gene pool perpetuation thinking. Then there's motiveless malignity, you know, that is Shakespeare's famous phrase, Schadenfreude, the Germans call it, how to you know, diss the other fellow, how to make his life less happy, that is Schadenfreude thinking. There's also playful, inventive, and creative thinking, you know, like all the great geniuses of the world, Mozart, Bach, I don't know, A.R. Rahman, that's pure God speaking through man's minds. Then of course, curiosity and discovery, all the Nobel Prize winners, Madame Curie, Love of humanity, altruism, love of the planet. I, sorry about this digression in the thinking. All the ones in blue are the ones we really need to think about when we think about the future of Indian cities. That's why I thought I'd sort of go into this little riff about thinking. So also there are certain thinking traps which is really getting in the way of where we want to go. <coughs> Basically, I, you know, I think it's called the theory of bounded rationality. The, economist Simon, Herbert Simon said that man has got a defect in thinking in that you think only about things which are tractable, which are doable, which are visible and immediate. You keep push under the carpet large problems which you can't see, which doesn't affect tomorrow or the week after, etc., which is why we are not thinking about which way we are going. 
We always, man and people and you and me and family, try to focus on the urgent at the expense of the important. I was just looking at a study, The Economist. The German scientists have done a study on insects. And they found in the last 28 years, 78 persons species have vanished off the face of the earth. 78 persons of insect species. The insecticide, it is not the other insecticide, it's a, it's a killing of insects. Now how is that going to affect uh, the herbs, the plants, nature, etc. that nobody knows about? The ecological Armageddon, as they say. So these are the kind of things that we don't have systems, we don't have mental habits, we don't have institutions to think about. So basically what I'm trying to tell you is you have to elevate your perspective, stop in your tracks, and do a lot of re design rethinking about how you want the cities of India's future, where 750 million people are going to live, are going to be. Actually, Kerala is not so much of an urbanized society as, yet as compared to other states. Tamil Nadu is much more urbanized, surprisingly. So we still have time to get this problem in hand. This I mentioned to you, you know, in my opening speech, you know, that about 9 million species, and humanity is the only species that destroys its host. So what do you call that? You call it a carcinogen. So are we becoming a mutant carcinogen on the face of the earth? If you don't get the urbanization problem right, definitely we are going to be that. Birds and elephants don't go, don't go to massive war with each other. You know, we elected a cretin in the United States of America as a president, and we got a madman sitting in North Korea. The whole world is now you know why the world has been peaceful for the last 70 years? Something called the Nash equilibrium, which the scientists and mathematicians know about. The Nash, John Nash, the famous Nobel Prize winning mathematician, says that you will sort of, your behaviors tend to sort of equalize each other. You will go for an equilibrium where the best possible outcomes are possible for everybody. The world has not gone into nuclear war because all the great leaders follow instinctively what is called the Nash equilibrium, all the nations, the balance of power, the Cold War, Kennedy versus Khrushchev, etc came to a stop on the basis of the Nash equilibrium. Now that is breaking down because people are, because of a blowback from globalization, people have elected the wrong kind of leaders everywhere, and there are some madmen still in some countries. And this is a very definite threat that someday some nuclear Armageddon is going to break out in addition to ecological Armageddon. So these are the kind of challenges which you young people will be facing when you go into business in future years. And this I mentioned. So, if you look at the five major problems this country is going to face, the five major challenges, this will be definitely one among the top five. How do you manage a community of 750 million people living in these, how many, 60, 60 cities in the future or so? That is, what is, uh, that is, that is something which we really have to think about. So this is a famous painting by this uh, Dutch master, Hieronymus Bosch. Hieronymus Bosch. Uh, what will happen if our cities are not planned? plague on the streets and total mayhem. The way it happened, you know. We never heard of chicken gunia and dengue in Kerala when I was a kid. Look at what's going to happen. Kerala, the whole of Kerala is turning into a huge waste dump. I drove up from Cochin yesterday. You find this dump and run scenario. You dump something and then you run. I live on the side of the Chelevenu Lake in Cochin. And what is really sad is all the wealthy guys who got waterfront, haciendas in Cochin, go and dump their stuff on. You can look at the garbage you can make out from the composition of the garbage. That this, all this garbage belongs to rich people, all the two ball beer cans and stuff like that. So this is the future which we'll be able to face if we don't stop in our tracks and decide what we want to do with the rest of our planet. Of course, this is the idyllic planned urban life. I believe a China sitting, China has become so ecological. One of the great good things happening is China has become very ecologically conscious. They're going to phase out the internal combustion engine. They're coming down on coal plants in a big way on air pollution, and they're building these vertical green cities all over. So if China can change, why can't we? China took the cusp of the, of the you know, last part of the industrial revolution, which we missed out, and now they're taking on the ecological challenge in a big way, and we are far behind even on that. So what are the key urban challenges? Water, energy, waste, and mobility, and they all feed into each other. And my area, my domain is mobility. What I want to talk to you about is mobility and how mobility can change cities and make those places a better venue for us to conduct the business of life. Now, I'll take a little di digression because I was told to speak to these kids about what are the challenges in building urban infrastructure business. You know, Kerala is a very difficult place to do business because if you, in the UP you have six stakeholders, in Kerala you have 32 stakeholders. When I started the Kochi Metro project, I tried to list down the number of people who have to be kept on the same page. It came to about 30, you know, the 
state government, the district administration, the Kuchi Municipal Corporation, the Railway Division, the Water Authority, the KSEB, the DMRC in Delhi, the DMRC in Kuchi, Dr. Sridharan, who's an icon by himself, etc., etc., the Kuchin Port Trust, the local MLAs, the MPs, the land losers, the fellows who have no other business but to go on TV and speak about various things. All this 30, came to about 30. You've got to manage about 30 stakeholders. That's one of the great challenges, even doing a business, you, know, you never know. Kerala is one state where you get all the permissions under a single window for starting a business and when you come down to the panchayat, they will not recognize the power of the state. Each man is a law unto himself. And really you have to, I call it waltzing on glass, you really have to waltz on glass to do any business in Kerala. Of course there are conflicting objectives and interests, you know, one of the great, but one of the good things I found in my last five years in Kochi Metro is that if you have purity of heart, people will come along. Malus are cynical, they like to diss other people. But they basically, I found, good at heart. And if you can communicate your purity of heart to them, they will come along with you. When I started five years back, we had a lot of environmental activists coming and eating our heads. So what I did was, people want a role in life. So all those guys, I don't want to name names, who come on the evening TV, I found an ecological group for Kochi Metro, and all the problems I dumped on their lap, I said, you are the boss, now we find a solution. So we, we could put up uh, the Metro Depot near railway on about, you know, nearly 100 acres of wetland, water wetland. And those are the guys who did the design for us. So basically give people a role, some, some, sense, of, some sense of importance, and they all come along with you. That's a good part of the whole Malu virus, how you handle that. Of course, there are political pulls and pressures from the local councillor, right up to the chief minister of the day. You have to have them on the same page in Kerala, and that goes not just for the metro, but for any kind of business which you young kids will start in future. This constant flux, keep, things keep changing all the time. And <clears throat> it's, it's so important to have all the parties together. And one great thing that we could do this infra in time in Kerala, which is good for you to know, is that you have to build consensus among all the people about the objectives of it. We are starting a high weather business in Calicut, for instance. You need to have public consensus that this is a good thing to do. We need this industry here, etc. Don't start something and then go around looking for people to buy into it. That's a very bad way of going. A lot of constant fluxes there, divided public opinion, diverse philosophies, you know, Kerala's got a whole gamut of political philosophies about what we need to do in life. So that's something we really need to handle. Land pressures. Kerala's impossible to acquire land. You can't, there's no land left for anything. So even in our, my project, we, we took about 500 parcels of land from various people. And these are fabulous, we have 40 cents of land, we come and take away the 20 cents facing the road, the best part of the land. But you could do it because people thought there was something, a better future in this project for their children. I still remember the case of one poor fellow, his name was Muhammad, I think. He had only some five cents of land left. He came and told me, it's so moving. He said, look, the PWD came and took my land away, the Water Authority came and took the rest of it, and now you want to take all of it. Okay, take it, but I don't mind it because my ch child will have a better future once the city grows. And that's the kind of attitude you need to have, and that's a great thing about care. We could acquire land from 500 people without an act, without the benefit of any land acquisition act. So basically, a lot of skepticism is there. There's a rampaging media. You know, all that is there. But you work on the better nature, the better, Lincoln, Abraham Lincoln said it very well, the better angels of our nature. Work on the better angels of people's nature, and everybody will come and push for you. And that's a lesson I've learned in five years. The huge distrust of government and of business, somebody's mentioned in the morning, even now, Capital is a hated word in Kerala. Value addition is a hated word. So all those things are there, but they're all on the surface, is what I want to tell you. A very turbulent and argumentative. The argumentative Indian, Namathya Sen, said, I think Kerala is an argumentative squared malu. So basically, but it's all sound and fury. Uh, I think if you can communicate only purity of intent, purity of heart, everything will make way for what you plan to do. And that holds good for the smallest entrepreneur as well as the largest part in Kerala. You know, this civilian port, so something I keep telling my friends in Delhi. On the very same day, the government ordered a judicial inquiry, the chief minister went and made the file foundation stone for that. These things will go on, this merry dance will go on, but basically people will come around, is what I'm trying to tell you. So quickly about uh, any of you planning to go into infra. One thing I would really like to, a thought I'd like to leave with you is that uh, spend a lot of time on the planning and the project report. Government Project reports in infrastructure are absolutely shoddy. We spend 2% of the project cost on the project preparation. While in the US it's 8, 8 to 10%. In Europe it's also 8 to 10%. You have to spend a lot of time 
and money on conceiving the project in making the World Bank has got a very nice uh, way of doing it. For a project of, in water supply which takes about three years to implement, they would spend two years on planning it. While in, uh, in India and Kerala, you know, the project report is cobbled together in three months' time and then you come with all kinds of difficulties. And the authors of the project report have very little stake in the outcome. They don't care how the project is implemented. So basically, these are the issues which you need to do. You want to start a business, you give it to some consultancy to do a project. That fellow has got no stakes on whether you're making a profit or loss or not. Spend a lot of time on getting the conception right. Do a lot of stress testing on that is what I want to leave. What thought I want to leave with you. For instance, again, take an example from Kochi Metro. The project report of Kochi Metro was not up to the mark. It was, it was again cobbled together by some engineer who had no sense of the city. It is by the alignment, even now it's a little. Uh, Open to question. They wanted to put this, what is called the AC, AC traction, which would have meant the whole city would have had those lines, naked electric lines running over the roads. So we had to do a lot of re engineering, and that is one thing we really have to be careful about when you're doing an infra business. Then, of course, so the, some of the questions you need to ask do we have political alignment? The central government, is it aligned with you? May not be applicable to small businesses, but is the state government aligned with you? Is the local panchayat aligned with you? Is the councillor happy that you're doing it in his ward? Do we have bipartisanship? Very important in Kerala. I mean, in the US, you have this concept of bipartisanship, where they, all the Democrats and the Republicans come together around large national objectives. So do you have local bipartisanship about where you're going to go? Are the LDF and the UDF and the BJP or whatever it is? Are they on board? Do we have community acceptance? That's one very important thing. This Kochi LNG terminal in Puduvai is going to you know, explode again another two days because the report is going to come out. Uh, because the local community there is very upset about the fact that these huge tanks are going to come there. And that's a neighborhood effect of large infra projects. One of the problems of large infra projects is what is called the neighborhood effect. All the good effects are far away, 500 kilometers away, but the immediate neighborhood of the project, there is no, nothing good. In Kudanglu, a nuclear power plant, we will all get power. Trivandrum will get power from Kodangula. But the guys in the neighborhood don't get nothing. Even now, Iliki Township is one of the worst connect connected places for electricity in Kerala. Even though the hydro plant is there. Because all the power generated there goes from the, on the 220 KV to Cochin and Calicut and so on. So this neighborhood effect is very, very essential. Do you have local community acceptance is some one question we've got to ask about. Then, of course, the end of term issues, you know, when the government is going to change in another one year's time, are the new guys who are going to come on board okay with this, this bipartisanship question? You really have to think about very hard, especially in states like Kerala. Yeah, I, I don't want to go on about it. I mentioned all this. But finally, you know, again, let me reiterate this. The most important question is purity of heart. If you have pure intentions, if you're not going to pollute the stream and the water, if you don't want to make, you know, Fast buck, a fast buck. We don't want to cheat people. We don't want to underpay people. I think there's a way that it all come around. I think Mr. Balgopal or Paul is there. He will know more about it about what I'm speaking, being a practitioner himself, who's taken the community along in this project in the early days. It's very important. And of course, the land issue is sorted out. Don't touch any investment without the land issue in Kerala being sorted out upfront. If you have parcels of land which you don't have and which you're leaving to the future, it's a very dangerous path to take. In India, we, uh, Mr. Jairam Ramesh in his uh, wisdom and goodness came out with this, what is called the Lara Act. Earlier, the Land Acquisition Act, even for private industrialists, was skewed in favor of the acquirer. Now they turn the center of gravity towards the acquiry it's so in such a complicated fashion that it's become nearly impossible to acquire land under the statutory act. So what the state governments have done in places like Goa and Rajasthan and Gujarat is they come out with state enactments which will restore the balance towards the entity like industries who want to acquire the land. It's not going to happen in Kerala for various reasons. So now we have this devilishly complicated job of operationalizing this Lara in Kerala. And this is the single biggest impediment to Kochi Metro also because the land we are the first entity in the country to acquire land under this Lara. And it's, in a way it's good, but it's very, very devilishly complicated. Till now, two and a half years later, we still not acquired a single piece of land despite trying very hard. The first parcel of land under this act is going to come to us in the end of December. So never touch an infra business, let me repeat it, without the land issue being sorted out. Then of course, if you're doing infra again, is the tariff regime dynamic? Is it secured by law? 
in Kerala, you have this BOT problem, you know, you do a toll road and after three years, the fellows will come and provide any enhancement of the tariff. In Kerala, not only do you need a legal, legal you know, sort of protection for your tariffs in future, you also need popular consent. Is it secured by popular consent? Do the people accept the fact that after three years, they're going to raise the tariffs? Some, something which you really have to ask yourself. Are there emerging threats to the revenue streams of the project through new technologies, new business models, like, like Nokia died and Sony Electronics died. The sharing economy is coming. The other day, Navin Bhattari called the CM, the Society of Indian Automobile Manufacturers, and told them that by 2030, the internal combustion engine is dead, and they've got to go into electricity, which is what the whole world is doing. Those guys are very upset. They tried to resist it very hard, all the bajajas and so on. But now I think they're, they're seeing sense. So you really have to think about how, in what way technology is going to emerge, going to venture into businesses. Tell me when my time is up. <clears throat> One very important thing in Kerala, whether you are doing a small business or a huge intra business, is that you really have to do a lot of outreach. And one of the things we did was to really constantly reach out to the people through our press conferences, social media, Twitter, our Facebook page has got five lakh hits a day. People are, the, things like metros are the new toy for the people. There's so much aspirational product. It's an icon of a better tomorrow for everyone. So everyone wants to know what you're doing today, what your plans are, what your business is going to be like. So we really could reach out to people and we took them along with us on every step of the way. And that's something very important in Kerala. You can't buy 30 acres of land and build a huge wall around it and try to do something inside. It's not going to work. Especially if those walls are really going to make people very suspicious. You really have to have tremendous outreach about what you're going to do and how you're going to do it if you want to succeed in a, in a locale like Kerala. We had this metro advisory group, I think one or two gentlemen here were members of that. And also this green group I mentioned to you, all the rabid activists were the ones who sorted out our environmental hassles for us. And also in government organizations doing infra business, you really have to keep ageism and sexism at bay, you know. One of the problems about government organizations is that we are still in the days of the old 19th century Victoriana, where the GM knows everything, the AGM knows a little less. The assistant manager knows a little less. All the innovations of Kochi Metro, which is now one of global acclaim, has been the work of young boys and girls in their late 20s and 30s. And one of the things I learned in my five years here, to be a good leader, all you have to do is to spend a lot of time selecting the right people and then get out of their way and empower them. So a lot of these senior funny daddies like me in my organization are very cut up with me. One guy, two, three guys have left because of that because the fellow, the girl or boy who is really ideational gets more power than him. And a lot of people can't put up, put up with it. And it, it's time the government organizations completely got into a startup culture and this stultifying thing of hierarchy, sexism, men know more, no more than women, etc. have really have to be destroyed in government organizations if we are to deliver in future. So all these ideas, vertical gardens, bicycle sharing, Formation, all the 1,400 buses in, in Cochin are now being formed into six companies. And one great thing is this Malsara Autumn will stop because there's no incentive to outdo the other fellow. You share the profits. All this has come from the kids in my office. Vehicle tracking, that automated fare collection system with the access bank. All this is the work of these young boys and girls. And I believe KMR is one of the most fabulous organizations in this country because the average age there is like you, 28, 30. And these boys and girls, I know in terms of idealism and passion and devotion to duty, this country is safe in their hands. So I'll skip over all this. In terms of business opportunities, somebody wanted to mention this. We are coming out with Scochi One Card and App, which will basically be a one-stop solution for everything you need in life. From paying your water bill, you have it, to your power bill, and a lot, number of private businesses we are going to onboard onto this Kochi One app and Garden, which is something which you young kids may like to look at. So I'll skip all this. This Kochi Water Metro, which will make Kochi the first city in the world where the metro seamlessly integrated into the ferry system. Istanbul has a bit of it, London has a bit of it, etc. We will really transform the whole of central Kerala because the water metro is going to fly for a length of about 80, 90 miles. And that is going to open up these hinterland for urbanism, for tourism, etc. And that's, I think, the whole of urban, the urban 
you know, the advantages of Central Kochi will permeate into the whole of the Lembanat Lake. There are a lot of business opportunities and tourism coming up all the way to the Trishur border and so on. Skip all this. So what is the vision that we have? Right? The days of the car for urban transport are over because two, three things are happening. One is that mobility is no more a product, it is a service. Sorry. I don't know. It's okay. So mobility is now becoming a service and not a product. The days, the Nobel Prize winner, what, Richard Taylor said something called the endowment bias. You have a car because your father had a car and your grandfather had a car and you want a better car. People have an emotional bias in favor of what they have. So you really want a bigger car. You forget about the outcome because you're focused on the output. What is the outcome? Mobility. And now in cities like Cochin and Delhi, it makes much more sense to you know, hire a car on demand than to have your own car. So these are the kind of models we are trying to do in Kochi. Public transport is also dying because Florida has taken all the buses out of their public transport system. Instead of which they're subsidizing Uber. So if you want to go anywhere at public transport rates, you just pay the Uber guy a subsidized rate. Why do you have your own government buses and whatever flying? So these are the kinds of changes taking place. And we, I'll stop here now and say Kochi will be the first city in India where the public transport system will be so comfortable and convenient and easy and that people will abandon their cars to travel within the city. The UNTA Act is going to the cabinet next week and once it becomes a law, we will have the legal teeth for it. And the buses, the metro and the boats will all become an interconnected system. So convenient that people will find it better to travel in that and do your Wi-Fi browsing on your phone than to go by car and stop at seven traffic lights. I'll stop here because I've been guillotined. Sorry to have you meandered on like this, but uh, Nice to see all these young faces and I, one thing my Cochin Metro experience teaches me is that you boys and girls are right in every sense. You have the idealism, you have the passion. Don't let the old guys stop your dreams from happening. Be a little prudent, think about the future, stop in your tracks and think of where you're going. And all of you have a very bright future, I'm sure. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for these in insightful thoughts that you've shared from your personal experience. May I request Professor Philip Anthony, former president of CMA, to come onto the desk to moderate the question and answer session. Okay, beyond any clarification, he explained it beautifully. I think he was a wonderful person. Thank you. Uh, let us give a good clap. But, but, Okay. One or two questions, sir. It is the privilege. Right. Okay. Please, thank you. Only questions. Okay, Mike, there, please. Good morning, Good morning everybody. I am Upen Dharam from Kuchin. Uh, sir, may I know when it is going to happen, this Kuchin water metro? See, the first boats are going to hit the water in March of 2019. There's a huge debate going on about whether we should need fiberglass or aluminum or steel, but once the debate is over, we will start the manufacturing. It will be an Uber operation or the metro will be doing it directly? Metro will be doing that. Thank you so much. So, uh, uh, in your presentation mainly you were talking about the challenges that we are facing when we are being a stakeholder into a business in Kerala. Uh, apart from the fact that the point you mentioned about the pure intent, uh, almost the other points they say that, you know, uh, it's probably impossible sometimes to do, get into the business aspect of it. Um, mostly mostly the intent of everybody is pure. I mean, everybody wants to do business and survive and give the jobs to others. Entrepreneurs are somebody who's going to create the jobs. So is it like uh, in the future it's going to get more and more difficult for us to get into the entrepreneurial street? I think things are getting much better. Uh, this, uh, you know, this uh, primitive notion that value addition in terms of money is a bad thing is, I think, is vanishing from especially the younger generation. I don't think it's there anymore. The, question, the problems they're going to face are on things like land and pollution, etc., which are very legitimate concerns. And I don't think Kerala is a venue where you should add value by destroying the ecosystem. Those days are over. As long as you have a business that is clean, morally, financially, and may I say spiritually, people will come along with you, is my, my feeling. My last question, please. Anybody? BQ? Why you pick them up? <laughs> uh, well, uh, you know, uh, we 
when, we, when I started the project, a lot of my colleagues in the IA said, you can't even put one pillar in because it's through the city and people will object to the noise, etc. Now we've done 1,000 pillars. It's taken a lot out of me. I've been sleeping and dreaming Metro for the last five years. Now's a good time to go because extension up to Kakinad and Triponitra and the water metro will take another such stint of about five years. And I thought I should let other fellows have a chance. When I came, nobody wanted this job, but now it's a very coveted one. So let somebody else do it. I'll move on to private uh, preoccupations. <laughs>